It's been 20 years since pop classic Mbop hit number one, sending Hanson to superstardom. Since then, the Oklahoma Brothers have sold more than 16 million albums and ventured beyond song making, launching their own beer company in 2013 and launching the Hop Jam Beer and Music Festival. And the band's entrepreneurial spirit was born long before these side gigs. Maybe you guys can take me back to your early days when you were just starting to gel and, uh, you know, obviously at an early age you all uh, were so musically inclined, um, but I don't know, how do, you, how do you tell the story? I'll just let you guys kick it off. Well, the story, I mean, it is interesting to think about business um, from the beginning when talking about our story because we, we did, from the very beginning, sort of think of it as um, this is ours. Like this is, it's not just I'm an artist and I want to go, you know, be free to be an artist. It was the sense that we really felt like we were building something from the very beginning. And, and I think um, you could say that probably about a lot of artists that think, you know, I'm going to start a band and then we get the van and then we have some merch. And so, yeah, we're building something. But we really talked about it um, in a way that, that was very tangible because we, we couldn't do things regular bands did. Uh, we had to really build it, you know, and as... Well, and we couldn't do regular things because we were so young. We were so young that we had to kind of really th outthink the, the regular band stuff. We couldn't just go to the bar and get a gig. And so we built mailing lists, you know, and really had a strong mailing list. As when I was, you know, 12, you know, we had several thousand names mm -hmm. and we would send mailings with, regular. we're doing gigs for the next three, you know, weeks or th two months, you know. And I think the spirit that's at the heart of our band, and I think something that that is probably overlooked about like us as a kind of our whole arc is we really started with this determination that we could, you know, that we really could do it, you know, for real. It wasn't a, a fluke. Um, and we had that local band work ethic um, that was, hey, if nobody else is going to do this, like we're going to have to make it. We're going to have to, we, we can't get the, the gig inside the bar. So we're going to play, talk to the bar owner and, and see if they'll let us play on the, on the porch. And so we would get a crowd to come around to the, to the outside deck where we were able to stand and perform. And that spirit of building it you know, by your own hands and really caring about the details is, is probably why we decided to start a record company and why we've you know, started a beer company and why we've you know, built things on our own is because that, that same energy of, you know what, someone else isn't necessarily going to get my vision. Someone else isn't necessarily going to walk up and say, here's your menu of these five things that, that you could do. We're going to have to make up our own menu. If we think about the world of business or people like Steve Jobs, right? They yeah. don't see that product out there. They think, what could we do that people might ultimately want? Thinking ahead almost. There's an urgency to, to figure out how to innovate, how to see what's not there. Because um, we've actually seen like the coming of age of the internet and then the hope that this would actually be a renaissance. And it's been, a, a, once again, it's a renaissance in one you know, way, the content's out there and there's so much amazing possibilities. But once again, our industry has handed over the control of the music and content to some of the same dinosaurs. You know, we've got Jimmy Iovine running Apple Music, we've got Leroy Cohen running YouTube, we've got, we've got the guys that killed the old industry running the new one. And, we, and then we've handed our rights to technology right. companies yeah. like Spotify who are pillaging, like they're using our content to sell it like gum at the, you know, at the grocery store aisle. You know, I mean, we dude, we'd be well off if they were selling it for the price of gum. So, yes. and so, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, actually, somebody might actually be able to make a living, especially up and coming artists. So the, the, the urgency, part. there's this. There, I feel it's like a serious sense of urgency, like thinking about the fact that my 15 year old who loves music or you know Zach's nine year old that might be a drummer in 10 years that for real want to be in a band or want to do something like what is the industry going to look like for them because that and so seeing the iPad before the iPad is needed I think is really 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 needed now from artists not just from yeah. the business guy but from artists that realize that they are the innovators they are Steve Jobs. There's also the issue of risk and being willing to take a risk and early in your career you guys were willing to say starting our own label mm -hmm. yeah. is an option mm -hmm. so even though some things haven't changed in the industry sometimes for the individual artists things don't change because they don't change so talk to yeah. us about that evolution for you as well yeah. well I, I think it's important to juxtapose the risk of starting a label with the risk you face as a band with a 
apathetic label, right? So uh, in 2003, we started uh, 3CG Records uh, after releasing two albums with a major. Uh, our second album, they uh, had a huge merger and really we saw almost everyone who worked with us get fired and replaced. During the making of the second record. <laughs> During the making and release of the second record. And, and what we discovered uh, sort of in a way that was undeniable on the third album was um, they were willing to wait till uh, whenever. Spending our money that we had to recoup, um, watching our fans go become fans of other bands, and not having any plan for connecting and building and growing and uh, essentially that long tail, which is really all that you have really with a career, is the long tail. Uh, and so the risk was really apathy or money, right? We had enough success that we all had, you know, been smart with money that we could go, okay, let's, let's pool and let's hire people to work for us and let's you know, build a, a new, you know, endeavor. Uh, an or, expensive or, endeavor. Or let's watch it fade away and go into nothing. Go into sort of the expectation, right? The expectation is that um, a lot of bands or most bands, I think, have one big album and then they disappear. And that's really often the product of a system that is designed to let bands disappear. And we just said, we're not going to go quietly into the night. You know, we're, we're going to take risks away you know, when we started as a band and we were too young to play in bars and... Um, you know, our peers were playing soccer games on the weekend and we were driving to Wichita to play a gig or, yeah, exactly. you know, like uh, we were doing things that were out of the ordinary, taking social risks, right? And so um, financial risk is, is not that much scarier than, than that. And uh, so we continue. I, I also think, too, that one of the things, one of the things I think for us is that we've, kind of always been the underdog to some degree or another. We've always been a little bit of an odd bird. You know, whether it's when you're starting out as a band and you're so young, you can't do the normal things that a band does, playing the bar gigs or whatever, so you've got to find other avenues for that. Whether it's when you do get signed and you make a record, you're both a band who is extremely young. Zach is 11, Taylor is, you know, 14, I'm 16 years old. We're a band, we're also a group of singers, so we do three-part harmony and play as a band. We're also songwriters, all these things combined. And then in addition to that, all of the other stuff around you is not the same stuff. And some of the stuff that is kind of similar is really different as well. Like, you know, you might have young fans, but the other bands that have young fans are not like you at all. So you, we've always found ourselves in a little bit of a spot where we're not like a lot of our peers and I think that's played to our advantage in the long term is it creates an appetite for risk. It creates a willingness to say, wait a second, no one's doing this. Oh well I'm used to being the only one doing something. And also to look at all the opportunities around you. I mean you think about how does a business stay fresh or young, they might start a new business line that's still gonna make sense to all their investors because it's it's relevant to what they do. And that gets us to things like beer or music festivals, two things that just came very naturally as an extension to what you're all about. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about the evolution there. Well, understanding your, yourself, first know thyself, right? That's the commandment. Know who you are, right? <laughs> it's hard to fix, it's hard to do things well when you're not really sure where you stand. And we, we know very clearly that we, we have built a connection with an audience and it's bigger than a song. And so when, when we were looking at kind of expanding who we are, we, we saw that um, through a lot of our events and our tours that there was a community that had formed that was there for each other, not just for us. And we, we learned from like watching The Grateful Dead and sort of studying them. Our first manager was a huge deadhead and others like that and said, gosh, what are they doing? And so about, well now it was 2011 when we sort of decided to really go after the craft beer thing, we saw that if we were passionate about something and we could share that authentically, then that we could include that in the, pa you know, in the growing you know, reach to that audience. And the other thing is we didn't forge those paths just to milk an audience. We, we went down that path for the same reason we went down the music path you know, or the label path. Just a final question I wanted to ask about 
the early success, just mind-blowing, really. Yeah. We've had a lot of guests on this series that have had that moment. It's really the moment that gives you a lot of the opportunities that you end up having. But what's that like? What are the lessons that you learned through that that have set you up for where you are today? Uh, nobody's going to care as much as you do. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a good, good one. one. No one's ever going to care as much as you do. And, um, and also that you're um, ultimately, it, it has to be about what you're doing, you know, not, not the attention you're getting. It has to be about you know, remembering that you're, you're there because you did something.